The first witness called got a rough ride from Gameshi's defense lawyer this morning. Marie Heenan is the Henan rather is the defense attorney and she pointed out discrepancies in the stories she told the media, police and the court and Heenan introduced what she appeared to be flirtatious emails sent long after the complainant's alleged assault in Gameshi's home. Gameshi is facing four counts of sexual assault and one count of overcoming resistance by choking and there are two more complainants waiting to testify at the trial. Let's go to the CBC's James Murray. He's at the courthouse in Toronto. Uh, let's begin with uh, Hennen and, and her reputation in the legal community uh, being a very tough defense lawyer and I guess we saw a bit of that this morning. Well we certainly did and You've often heard the phrase before to see something tested in court. We say people have made allegations, but they haven't been tested in court. This was tested in court. And, and fairly so, considering that uh, some serious allegations have been made against Jean Gomeshi, and they must be proved in court beyond a reasonable doubt. There are some serious penalties on the line, too. Years and years in prison, possibly life in prison, if the choking charge is, is held with a guilty verdict. So these should indeed be tested in court, and they were today. As, as you said, Marie Hennon went through the various statements that this complainant has given, first to the media, including the CBC, second to the police in a sworn statement, and third here today and yesterday under oath at Old City Hall Courthouse in Toronto. There were discrepancies between the various statements that were given. For instance, was this woman, when she said she was attacked by uh, Gomeshi, thrown to the ground, pulled to the ground, pushed to the ground? Three different words have been used, uh, at, and Marie Hennon says, how, how do you explain these different words? And the complainant would say, well, my memory of these things is the same. Sometimes the words I attach to them are different. These are things that have not set well with the defense. The complainant said uh, she'd, when she'd given her statement to the police that she was nervous, that she sometimes uh, spoke too quickly and maybe not as thoughtfully as she might have. When the defense suggested that this might in fact be a lie as opposed to nervousness, the complainant said, I told them the truth. Hennon says, and your truth, you'd agree with me, keeps changing. The complainant, I wouldn't agree with that. These are memories I'm recalling. That was the, the, the stuff that we heard this morning. This afternoon, there was a little bit of a bombshell when this complainant talked about being traumatized by uh, Gomeshi and had told the police she'd had no further contact with them. It seems there was further contact. In about 2004, she sent a couple of email messages uh, to Gomeshi. Uh, the complainant said, I did that to get him to call me and to tell me why he hit me. Hennon then showed an attachment with one of the emails. You emailed Mr. Gomeshi a picture of you in a bikini. I find that an implausible explanation. Then, referring back to those police statements, she said perhaps there was some untruth because she had said in the police statement that she would never see Mr. Gomeshi again, have no contact with him. I never have and I never will. Hennon said, you lied to the police. Some very strong stuff. The complainant said that she had not lied to the police, that she was nervous, and that's where things were pretty much left at the end of the cross-examination. It was a very combative and very dramatic couple of moments, and they could go a long way towards deciding some of these charges against Gian Gomeshi. Well, as we say, Hennon having a really uh, strong reputation as being tough on the people she cross-examines. We got uh, a sense of that today. Now, we should also point out the, the breaking news this hour is that the afternoon session has now been postponed. Uh, what's going to un unravel here? What happens next now? Uh, well, they were taught this has gone very quickly the cross-examination did I, I want to point out too that at no time did it seem like uh, Marie Hennon was in any way disrespectful or mocking I have seen defense lawyers in the past at trials Almost walk up to the line of making fun of a witness's testimony that certainly didn't happen today Marie Hennon came armed with facts and emails and statements written down on paper that contradicted each other. Uh, at no times did she really seem disrespectful, but she was very blunt in, in su suggesting that the witness was lying. She got through the cross-examination probably quicker than everyone was planning. The Crown has said they could have other witnesses here, but they weren't planning to have them today. Probably can't get one here until as early as Thursday. They assured the judge that the trial is still on the timeline. They'd set out this two to three weeks, uh, that by the end of three weeks the trial will be over, that they are actually ahead of time, even though it's only been a couple of days and that this will in no way delay justice, but there won't be a court sitting tomorrow. 
James, thank you for this. The CBC's James Murray in Toronto. Well, from the courthouse in Toronto, let's go to Halifax right now. Elaine Craig is an assistant professor of law at Dalhousie University. She specializes in sexual assault law, and she's in our Halifax studio right now. Elaine, I, I want to begin with the cross-examination. As we were talking with James, uh, fairly tough. Uh, we saw things introduced uh, like emails that seem to be flirtatious, uh, bikini shots sent uh, after the alleged uh, assault took place. What do you make of the cross-examination today. What's your reaction to all that? Sure. Well, uh, defense counsel in this case is a very effective cross-examiner. Uh, she's doing her job. Um, I do think it's important to remember that at the end of the day, the judge will be charged with assessing this evidence in, in the context of uh, the case as a whole. But uh, certainly she's a very effective cross-examiner and that uh, was demonstrated today. Well, you say that almost hesitantly. Why? Uh, I'm not sure I say that hesitantly. I just, uh, you know, it's difficult to, to, to speculate too much uh, or weigh in when you weren't actually present to, to observe the cross-examination in person. But from the coverage and the information that, that I've read, it sounds like it was a very effective cross-examination. You do, though, but, I, I believe, uh, have concerns about how complainants are, are, are treated or how they, the kind of uh, experience they have through the courts when they bring up issues of uh, sexual assault and allegations of sexual assault. Sure, yes, I certainly do. As a general matter, so, um, you know, not speaking to the treatment of this complainant in this proceeding, we certainly do have lots of examples in sexual assault cases today and in the past few years where complainants have been cross-examined at length. Uh, I'm going to interrupt here. Elaine, let me interrupt. I want to bring our audience to Toronto right now. We have uh, pictures coming from the Toronto Courthouse at Old City Hall. There is Jean Gameshi leaving the courthouse with his lawyer, Marie Hennen, as we said. Tough cross-examination today. He leaves the courthouse as he did yesterday with a lot of uh, police around him as well as the attention of many media members taking pictures, providing us this video. He is at this point leaving again Old City Hall in Toronto, now a courthouse where his trial is taking place. And let's go back to Elaine uh, Craig in Halifax. Sorry to interrupt you, Elaine. We want to show that to our viewers. Sure. Uh, but no you problem. were talking about the the system and, and the, the treatment and the experience that uh, complainants have as they bring up issues of sexual assault. Sure. There are lots of examples of cases, speaking generally again, where complainants are bullied, where the cross-examination is, I would suggest, unnecessarily aggressive, where stereotypes find their way into the, either the cross-examination or the reasoning. And, and so there are lots of reasons to be concerned as a general matter, not speaking specifically to what ha occurred today, obviously. Mm -hmm, obviously. Uh, but that said, I do also want to read something to you right now. This is from an editorial sure. that was written in the Toronto Star today. And this is from lawyer uh, Breeze Davies. And she writes, uh, the trial process, including the right to test the complainant's evidence, is the only protection an accused person has against being wrongfully labeled and sentenced as a sex offender. So, so when you read that, uh, Putting holes or looking for holes in a complainant's story is, is part of that process. How do you square that circle, if you will? How do you, at, on the one hand, provide a reasonable defense for someone? Mm -hmm. There's still the presumption of innocence here. How do you provide a reasonable defense, but at the same time, not be disrespectful to the complainant who's bringing up this issue? Certainly. So, I mean, I think you do the kinds of, you use the types of strategies that you saw used by defense counsel today. It is their job to point out inconsistencies. You know, the, the, the reality is that complainants are typically asked to give statements as to what occurred on multiple occasions over several years. And so it's understandable anyone would have inconsistencies. Uh, I would say, though, that it is not inevitable that defense counsel need to be disrespectful, that they need to be overly aggressive, and certainly they don't need to and shouldn't, I would argue, are ethically obligated not to trade in the types of stereotypes that the law has tried to eliminate. So uh, how do we do it? We do it in the, in the manner demonstrated uh, by defense counsel in the Gameshi proceeding today. You, you had commentary uh, prior to, to speaking with me that suggested it had been, to, to this point, respectful and, and uh, 
professional, and, and so it isn't inevitable that we need to uh, whack the complainant in order to pursue the truth in a criminal trial. Obviously, the story is getting a lot of attention, not only here in Canada, but uh, parts of the UK, parts of the United States. What effect do you think this trial will have in terms of how people proceed with these types of cases? Well, it's difficult to, to speculate too much, but you know, I, I think the degree of public scrutiny and the attention to this is unprecedented. It would be uh, unusual, perhaps has not happened to date in Canada, to have the kind of almost real-time coverage, the live blogs, the, the tweets that are, you know, covering this as it's occurring. So this is unprecedented scrutiny on, on the process. It's also not typical. Um, you know, many, many of these cases are heard across Canada every year and, and no one's watching. So it has the potential to, you know, I think there's both upside and downside potential because of how much attention is being paid to this case. Elaine, I want to thank you very much for your time. That's Elaine Craig, Assistant Professor of Law at Dalhousie University. Now, CBC News will remain uh, on this story. In fact, we have reporters in the courthouse as Jean Gameshi's trial continues. Again, it picks up on Tuesday. It's now been adjourned for today. But you can follow our live blog. All you need to do is head over to cbcnews.ca, follow the links, and stay with us right here on CBC News Network for continuing coverage of this.